and we are back as you notice i'm in my pink because it's the month of october and we are celebrating the awareness of breast cancer so thank you so much for joining us it's time for your body and you and joining us this morning is breast cancer surgeon dr liron olivier to talk to us about not only screening but treatment options and just you know the how the patient can have the best experience Good morning to you, Dr. Oliver. Morning, Thank you morning. so much for joining us. So, thanks for having me this morning. Yeah, and I see you meet up with the CIC yeah, guys yeah. Here over there. So y'all can y'all need a minute to bond yeah. or anything? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this pink is the color, not green. Okay? <laughs> okay? Don't yeah, get so like uh, <laughs> a sense of a sense of comfort. Yes, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I realize, I realize I, I, Dr. Oliver, like, yeah, I'm cool. I'm, I've been here before. We're good. Definitely. So Dr. Oliver, mm. you know, being a breast cancer surgeon. I don't think I've ever spoken to a surgeon before. Last week we had a survivor, and the week before, mm -hmm. just to share in their story of, of, you know, the detection. For, luckily for them, er, early detection and going yeah. through. And of course, the story always starts with screening. How yeah. important screening is. But before we get into that, just for a basic synops synopsis of what it really means when you say somebody has or has been diagnosed with breast cancer. So, you know, first we start off what breast cancer is. Yeah. Breast cancer is really an abnormal growth of the can of breast cells. And the breast cells may be the ductal elements, which is the, the elements that drains the milk, or the glandular elements, which is the elements that produce the milk. And the most common one tends to be the ductal element. Mm -hmm. um, so breast cancer is really an abnormal, uncontrolled growth of those cells. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the, the when a patient is diagnosed with breast cancer, means that that abnormal cell you know, it has a potential to be um, to overgrow and potentially create uh, different cycles where it reaches the late stage of where it can actually spread beyond the confines of the breast. Right. So when we talk about benign and non-benign, mm -hmm. are both abnormal growths? So a benign growth is one that is is, is a growth in itself, but it's, it's controlled to the confines beyond a particular. Um, it doesn't spread beyond that area. So you know, it's it's really on a on a level of a histological level where you look at the cells contained within a particular area and cancer cells go beyond that basement membrane we call it and that's where the cells can actually infiltrate into local structures and spread distally so a benign growth is, is not a cancerous growth but it's a growth that can proliferate um, most lumps actually in breast ca breast that woman present to my clinic is really benign growths you know most like about 70 percent of a woman who, who complain of a breast lump it actually is benign but it's important to it's important when you to when when you find that lump or feel that lump to go yeah. and 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 and, uh, and check it you with your doctor. What I think is even more important than 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 finding a lump is is knowing your breasts. I think as a woman, you need to examine yourself and be aware of your breasts, be aware of changes, because you may not find a lump per se. You know, you may find something that is different. So for example, something a new nipple discharge or a irregular symmetry in the breasts or uh, a thickening of the skin or a bit of dimpling of the, of the, of the area of the breast is, is deviating to one side in comparison to how it was before. So I always advise, you know, at a particular time in the month, a woman should, ex should examine themselves. Generally, about the seventh day um, after your period, that's when the breast is less engorged or, or edematous from periods. Um, and that's the best time to examine for abnormalities. Mm -hmm. But really, you should be aware of your, your breast. And again, you know, seeing that is just a lump as a presentation, that is one presentation. There's so much other presentations um, for breast cancers. And, and I'm happy that you raised that because you, you're right. A lot of times all we talk about is the lump. You yeah. know, I found a lump. Last week we had Sarita Rampasad. Uh, this is her first year of, uh, she doesn't like the word, you know, surviving breast cancer because she says to her it's yeah. something you're always going through. Yeah. You know, but is that for her, is that she just kind of felt a, a soreness or pull under her arm. Yeah. And she said something in her head just kept telling her, yeah. you know, go and check it out, go and check it out. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about those other signs or symptoms that we can look out for. You said... Yeah. An, the, so the discharge, so indentation of the nipple. Yeah, so you, so you can start off with a simple lump. Um, there may be a bit of change in the symmetry or, or the shape of the breast. You may have some thickening or tethering of the skin. The skin. You may actually have some inversion of your nipple. Some women nipples are naturally inverted. But if again, if there's a change, you know, that is something new. Um, you could also present with a lump in the armpit, um, you know, and there's some tenderness. But rarely, most women present to the clinic with a complaint of, of breast pain. It's very rare that breast cancer presents with pain. Um, almost about three to four percent of women that present with breast pain actually is breast cancer. Mm -hmm. But again, 
once there's a change, you should seek a consult with a physician just to, right. to confirm if there's any underlying problems. Right. And uh, let's say we, we find something abnormal, whether yeah. it's a lump, whether it's pain, whether whatever it may be. Yeah. What are the different ways in which you can get screened for breast cancer? Because we talk about the mammogram, but are there right. other ways to screen and what are the differences? So, so be before we get into that, I just want to clarify. So when you have a lump, it's not screening anymore. That's diagnostic. Mm. Screening by principle is picking something up before it becomes symptomatic. So screening is what we want to do to pick things up early before it presents. So mammogram is the probably only um, available option we have for screening internationally. And it has shown, there's a lot of controversies with mammograms, but it has shown a reduction in mortality rates, you know, significantly somewhere between 28 to 48 percent worldwide. Yeah. Um, but again, so, so when you talk about mammogram, we use it as a diagnostic tool if you present to me with a lump. But it's also the best way to use it is as a screening modality so I can pick a lump early because we know early detection leads to a better outcome, a better survival, right. and a greater chance for cure. Well, you're talking about a lump, but what yeah. are those other symptoms? Can the mammogram say, right. you know, what's happening there if you have, let's say, the, the indentation with the nipple or yeah. the pain under the arm or, yeah. you know, the discharge? Yeah. Does it treat so with those other signs? So, so the, what the mammogram is really, it's a, it's a, a x-ray of the breast. So the breast has two main components, really, fatty, fatty components and glandular components. And if you have an abnormality in the breast, you may be able to see uh, that change. It tends to be white, just like the glandular elements. Um, you may be able to see something called microcalcifications. Those are some of the, the, the epithelium in the cancer cells. They produce some extra calcium, mm -hmm. and they have certain particular patterns. You may be able to see some edema in the breast. You may see some thickness in the skin on the mammogram. But really, the nipple discharge, the, the, the you may see some asymmetry, some architectural changes. Um, but really, it's, it has to go hand in hand. So an assessment of a woman with a lump is, is what we say triple assessment. So it's history, examination, mm -hmm. then radiological investigation, which can be a mammogram first line, and then you do an ultrasound scan, if based on the age of the woman and the density of the breast, and then a biopsy to confirm what we, we, we are concerned about. So a mammogram is part of the tool and the, the cascade of, of, of so it's stuff. It's both for screening and diagnostic. Yeah, both for mm -hmm. screening and diagnostic. But yeah. when you have a lump, it's, it's diagnostic, it's not screening. Right. All right. So what other screening methods are there, if any at all? So, you know, um, you have things like self-breast examinations, or you have um, examination from a, a physician. You know, the, the, the data doesn't support it. The data actually says that there's no in decrease in mortality rates with, with self-breast examination. But mm -hmm. we know, and I, I, you know, I think that data is probably skewed for whatever reason, but we know most of our cancers in developing world countries present with the patient identifying it. In a developed world, mm -hmm. so for example, in my fellowship in Canada, in a developed world, they actually, most of our cancers were radiologically found on screening. So the patient didn't have lumps. They present with an abnormality on the mammogram, and we did a biopsy and we confirmed cancer. So that, that itself shows the cascade of things. If you can pick a cancer up in mammogram and don't pick it up on a mass, obviously that is an earlier cancer. The survival is going to be better in comparison to the survival that you know, we may see in our patients. Right. So in our populations, unfortunately, most of our patients present in an advanced state. And that has a lot of factors. And that's why this is important. Right. Because Education is key. A woman needs to know that she needs to examine herself at the early, you know, early symptoms yeah. and present for treatment earlier because your survival is directly correlated to early presentation than a late presentation. Yeah. Unfortunately, most of our patients come with lumps that are, are very big, palpable, sometimes even fungating, coming through the skin, unfortunately, as bad as the tongues. Um, but that's what we see. And we see that a lot in the rural setting where patients are just, there's not no promotion of, of of breast cancer awareness. So, so you think even what we're doing here now might even miss people in rural communities, yeah, maybe so because of the lack of access to, well, you know, whether you know, it's internet or TV or con just connectivity. Yeah, and, and that's, that's what the primary health care is about. It is about reaching out to the population and actually teaching. So, you know, the health centers do, do a good job in that. When you come to the, the chronic illness clinics, these are the doctors, they were supposed to educate the nurses and they, they have programs that they will teach, especially now, like in the Eastern region, the nurses and they will do little promotions. We'll go and give little talks about breast cancer awareness. But it's all about awareness. Yeah. And that's why this is key. And yeah. I, I don't think we should treat cancer just in October alone or talk about cancer in October. This is something right. that should be done throughout the year. Because breast cancer is the number one cancer in the world now. Mm -hmm. So earlier this year, WHO actually, it was lung cancer. Now breast cancer is number one. 
And do we have mm. any connection to family history to see, okay, if there is uh, history in your family, there is, a, there is a greater chance or percentage of you, you know, being diagnosed with breast cancer? So, so, and so that is important, but it's a small proportion. Only 10% of women that present with breast cancer actually have a genetic mutation or a family associated with it. So most women, some women will think, you know, I don't have any family history of breast cancer, so the chance of me having breast cancer is slim. But that's not true. Most of the breast cancers are sporadic, meaning that it happens for whatever reason. Sometimes there are risk factors, which we can get into, things like alcohol, cigarette smoking, obesity, um, hormonal changes, taking hormonal replacement therapy. You know, all those things are risk factors. But those are modifiable risk factors, and those risk factors only reduce your risk by about 30% if you modify them. So there's still a big element of, of idiopathic cause that we're not too sure about. Right, so what causes it? Yeah, so the genetic mutation itself and the familial is only about 10%. Mm -hmm. So even if you don't have a family history, you should still seek examination. You should still start your screening because it's all about early detection. And you said the best screening, or at least the earliest screening, is us as women checking ourselves. I think so. The best what, is what of the mm -hmm. men, though? Do, do We know that men can present with breast cancer, but mm -hmm. should they do the same routine examination of the breast as we do? So the risk of... The, the percentage of male breast cancer is somewhere between 0.5 to 1 percent. So it's still there. Mm -hmm. But again, it's all about knowing yourself, you know, knowing when something is abnormal, something is different. So yes, a man should probably examine himself, uh, be aware of himself, uh, be aware if there's any abnormality or changes in the breast. You know, the biggest thing with men do is, is something called gynecomastia, where you get um, enlarged breast in the men on both sides bilaterally. But that's a benign entity. Uh, but again, if you have something like that, you should probably get clinically examined as well to see if there's any underlying masses as well. Right. So let's say we get to that screening. <coughs> there is there's that tumor or mass or changes in the breast that may be suggesting breast cancer. Let us look at treatment options now because yeah. I know that this is so important for people because we're in the 21st century and I know that it's important for people to know that yeah. there are options out there. Yeah. So, you know, Firstly, one of course dependent on early detection. Exactly. Let's just you know, always that's, that's put that there. That I, I just that's like <laughs> the take home message today is really about early and that's what breast awareness is about. Early yeah. detection. The earlier the lump is detected, obviously the treatment is going to be a less aggressive and your chance of cure is there. When you so the, the, the big extreme is stage one and stage four. Stage four is where you have metastatic breast cancer. We can't cure you. It's already in the system. Yeah. Stage one, stage two, stage three, we, there's a greater potential for cure. And it's obviously greatest at a stage one, a early breast cancer. All right, so just jumping into the treatment modalities, really, it's, it's surgical. Um, depends on your stage. You know, the old dogma of your breasts have to be removed for breast cancer is just thrown out. You know, mm -hmm. I do a lot of what we say oncoplastic surgery, where we try to preserve the breast parenchyma as much as we can. Obviously, there are strict indications. There are patients who will not be candidates for that, and there are patients who will be candidates for that. Right. But I don't want women to feel that if it is that you have a breast cancer, it means I must have a mastectomy. It's not, you know, it's not the clear cut management for breast cancer only. Not so there anymore, are not because anymore. that's what we, we, we were taught early yeah. in the game that, yeah. you know, to reduce the risk of the cancer coming back is yeah. just best to remove the breast. Yeah, and, that, and that, that's, you know, that's what we should do about promotion because that's the old, the old Halstead technique. So in the past, they used to remove everything, muscle, chest, breast, everything in one. But we know now that if you preserve the breasts versus doing a mastectomy, the survival is the same. You may need to have some additional adjuvant therapy, such as radiation therapy um, or chemotherapy as well. But we know that the survival, there's no difference in survival if I remove a woman's breast versus doing a mastectomy or preserving the breast. But again, there are strict guidelines. Certain things like inflammatory breast cancers, um, multifocal, multicentric breast cancers, patients who cannot have radiation, those are some of the basic indications that so I will there determine. there are different types of breast cancers. They are, they are. So there are mainly two main ones. That's, that's you know, there are a lot more I can get into, but the main two is really based on the origin of the breast cell. So the ductal carcinoma in situ, the lobular carcinoma in situ, and then you could have a different presentation, which is called inflammatory breast cancer, which is a very aggressive form of cancer, where it presents like an inflamed breast. It looks like an infected, you know, breast, but it's actually a breast that is inflamed suddenly, and almost a third of the breast is inflamed um, with changes within that sudden onset. That's an aggressive type of cancer. That most of the time tends to end up having a mastectomy. I think we'll ever get to the point where we can get away from chemo or radiation because we know that 
you know, even with these, even though they're treatment yeah. options and they may preserve life, is that yeah. they too may come with side effects. Yeah. So and we don't have much time left. I don't know where know. it goes, but if yeah. we could just look a little bit at, you know, what life after chemo or radiation yeah. might mean for the patient. What are some of those changes yeah. that they may experience in their day-to-day -day lives? So firstly, you know, the cancer survivors, they do an awesome job. So when the ladies meet together in oncology center, the survivors support the guys who are going through the chemo. And then when the patients finish their chemo, they support the ones that are starting. So it's like a big family. Um, so the changes really is dependent on what treatment modality you have. Um, in terms of the chemo, um, you know, women go through that initial change of sometimes hair loss and other joint pains and body pains. Again, you know, it's for a period of time and the support from the other cancer survivors help patients go through it. In terms of the radiation, you know, you can get sometimes, you can get some skin burning like a bad sunburn. But you know, it's all about risk and benefit. You know, yeah. we have to make a decision to see if this, the risk of the complications overweigh the benefit from the treatment. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's personalization of care. So each patient is personalized. So each patient I see, the treatment may not be the same, but we stage you and treat you internationally for your particular stage. But it's all about personalization, your risk factors, your medical history, your background, what you can undergo and what you cannot undergo. So the doctors have a lot ahead of them in just yeah. treating each patient, has to yeah. be tailor-made according to the patient. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's why it's, it's important to have a multidisciplinary meeting. So it's not just myself. So don't think I'm the only person that make a decision. There's the radiation oncologist, the medical oncologist, there's the, the radiologist, the pathologist, the we have social workers involved, and all this is available in the government service. We all do it as a unit, and we have meetings once a week or every two weeks to discuss each patient and come up with the best management moving forward. Wow, that is amazing. Yeah. W when we had Sarita, she was talking to us about the fact that she just has to watch herself because she doesn't sweat anymore in certain yeah. parts and that she what are the dangers of this because that's something that i'd learned for the first yeah. time that because she had her breasts removed yeah. and having gone it through the radiation and stuff that she doesn't sweat you know it, it depends on on the surgical procedure i don't know the exactly what she yeah. had and it depends on the extent of what tissue was removed sometimes we have to evaluate the breast cancer to see if it has spread to the lymph nodes in the armpit and sometimes you remove some of the sweat glands there and that will reduce her ability to sweat you know mm -hmm. um, but all these things may be for a period of time they may or may, or may not improve so again it's difficult to say which you know if it's going to happen to everyone it depends on the extent of surgery because you know there are a lot of different modifications we do now in terms of evaluating the armpit mm -hmm. you know sometimes we don't take all the nodes out anymore or clean the armpit out totally what we do really is do a biopsy so it reduces the complication rates so there are, there are new techniques and skills that are evolving but what i want patients to know is that you know come to us and let us have a discussion and sit down and discuss the, the various options. Yeah, Don't just be afraid of My director is telling me I have to yeah. go, but I must ask the <laughs> how often do we need to get screening and at what age do we start? So the practice in Trinidad, the guidelines that we have in Trinidad is at age 50, that's WHO. But it's a, again, it's a controversy. Again, it should be guided, personalized. So you will come to me and you will tell me your risk factors and I may say you may need to start at age 40. So in, in the United States, there are two different groups that say age 40 and one group say 50. And I think it should just be personalized for each patient. And, and that should be discussed with your physician or your breast surgeon as you need to see and, and based on your, your, your situation may determine how, how, often how often you get screening. Yeah. So it's all about knowing your family as well. So some people who have a genetic mutation, they even start screening at age 35. Yeah? Versus um, patients with more African descent tends to have a higher risk of breast cancer. In the United States, they start at age 40, 45. You know, but again, what we practice in Trinidad is really due to our limitations of resources. We start at age 50, yeah. um, but again, each case should be personalized. Doc, um, I want to thank you so much for speaking with yeah. us this morning. I hope for all the women are listening, and even the men, that we start those exams. Because as you said, regardless yeah. of what the data is saying, most of the patients, as you said, who presented to you in Canada, it's because they detected something yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. You know? So, so, so it's, all about, it's all about awareness, yeah, and knowing yeah. yourself. Yeah. All right, it's all about awareness and knowing yourself, so I'm going to see if I can learn, go and practice <laughs> to, to learn myself. All right, so it's time to go across the radio.